So this will come as a surprise to no one, but the world has gone digital. Literally, we have the world at our fingertips. It's where all of us go to find the things that we're looking for. And so as a business owner, it stands to reason that you need to make sure you are found by the people who are looking for the thing that you have, right? So you got a restaurant, you serve food, you take care of people. You want people who are looking for that to be able to find you. On today's episode, we're talking all about how to dial in your digital presence, and we're covering six specific areas. By the end, you're gonna have a bunch of uh, of easy takeaways, actionable tips you can put into practice right away to help dial in your digital presence, which simply means that you're gonna be able to be found, right? That people are gonna trust you and come to like you on the internet. This is how you, you acquire new customers. It's a super important piece to what we do, and we're covering all of that on today's episode of Restaurant Strategy. There's an old saying that goes something like this. You'll only find three kinds of people in the world. Those who see, those who will never see, and those who can see when shown. This is Restaurant Strategy, a podcast with answers for anyone who's looking. Thanks for tuning in. My name is Chip Close, and this is Restaurant Strategy, a podcast dedicated solely to helping you build a more profitable restaurant. We cover marketing, we cover operations, we cover a whole bunch of stuff in between. But each week, I leverage my 20 plus years in the industry to help you build that more profitable and that more sustainable business. Did you know I also work directly with operators all over the world through my P3 Mastermind program? What are the three P's? They stand for profit process and progress. They are literally our core values, the foundation of everything else we do in the program, right? So if you've got a busy restaurant, but are uh, struggling to generate consistent, predictable 20% profits month after month, then please set up a free 30 minute strategy session with me. I'll get to learn more about you and your restaurant. You'll get to ask some questions to see if you're a good fit for that program. Visit restaurantstrategypodcast.com slash schedule. Profit is quite literally the only thing that matters in your business. Once you have a profitable restaurant, you can talk about growing that restaurant or stepping away from your restaurant or even just coming in to dine at your restaurant instead of bussing tables or, or jumping behind the line. Again, schedule that free call with me by visiting restaurantstrategypodcast.com slash schedule. As always, you'll find that link in the show notes. Are you frustrated with managing your catering and private events with pen and paper or outdated programs? Introducing Triple Seat, the catering sales and event management software built for restaurant professionals by restaurant professionals. With Triple Seat, you will increase revenue and efficiency all while streamlining your operations. Let Triple Seat be your catering and event management assistant. You can generate leads, create tailored BEOs, facilitate online discussions, obtain electronic signatures, process payments, and everything in between. Triple Seat has you covered. Elevate and simplify your event management and take it to the next level with Triple Seat so you can focus on what truly matters, providing unforgettable experiences for your clients. For more information, visit TripleSeat.com slash restaurant strategy. Again, that's TripleSeat.com slash restaurant strategy. You will find that link as well in the show notes. Okay. So today we are diving into digital presence, right? How we dial in our digital presence. Again, like I said at the top, if the internet is where people go to find the things they're looking for, then you simply need to make sure that you get found by the people who are looking for what you have, right? So you run a restaurant, you uh, provide an experience, a specific kind of experience for a specific kind of person. You just need to make sure they know that you have what they're looking for. So over the course of today's episode, I wanna cover six specific areas and I wanna give you actionable tips, key takeaways in each of those areas, which in the end are gonna help you get found by the people who are looking for what you have, right? People who are hungry, people who want a restaurant like yours. They might just not, they, they may just not know that your restaurant is there or that your restaurant is the answer to their prayers. So the six areas we're gonna cover, again, systematically, we're gonna cover websites, SEO, press, 
citations, reputation management, and social media. Now, if any of that stuff sounds foreign to you, then stick around. Uh, I'm going to explain it all. Some of this does get technical. I'm going to make it as easy to understand as possible. And again, the key in each section here, you're going to understand. You're going to have key things that you can do right away. Either you go do it yourself, you talk to your managers, you talk to your IT guy, whoever uh, handles your website, whoever handles your SEO, you're, you're going to know what to say and what to ask them. So again, talking about how we dial in digital presence. Those are the six areas we're going to cover. Without any further ado, let's dive right into the first area, which is your website, right? This is where your digital presence begins. This is where the conversation has to begin because this is your, uh, your mothership. This is your digital home. In many ways, this is an extension of the restaurant, right? It should be an extension of the hospitality you provide in your restaurant. Simply put, this is the this is the stand-in for your restaurant on the internet. So it needs to be good. It needs to get across everything you need it to get across. It needs to be a clear representation. It needs to give people a sense of what they can expect when they come to dine at your restaurant. But there are very specific things that I look for in a restaurant website, and there are, and, and, and these are changing. So some of you who have been listening for the last four years, if you go way back to the beginning, we covered this, and we've covered this a couple of times over the years. But things change little by little. The internet evolves, and so our websites must evolve. So if there are things that I'm saying today that are different than what I've said in the past, it's simply because the world is changing and we must evolve as well. So this is current, up-to-date, really right up to the minute, what you need to know about building a website, for example, uh, that will be a good representation of your restaurant. Here's the first thing I'm going to say. Your website exists for one of two reasons. It needs to capture revenue or it needs to allow someone to reserve a time to give you revenue later. Now, simply put, that means it either needs to collect online orders, right? That's where you capture revenue there on your website, or it needs to let people very easily make a reservation to give you money later. So that's what I always say to my clients. I said, you know, your, your website has to uh, collect money or let people make an appointment to give you money later, right? It's the, it's the same basic thing. And when you boil it down to that very simple thing, what we're really talking about is a CTA, a call to action. You have to understand what action you want someone to take when they visit your website, right? You're, before you do anything, before you start building a color scheme, before you add your logo to the website, you have to know, what do I want people to do when they visit my website? The answer is not, learn more about me and get really excited by me and, and ooh and ah over the, the pictures on my website. None of that pays your bills. So your website needs to exist to get someone to take the action you want them to take. And if that sounds callous, I'm sorry. That's really what it is. Now, this is a departure because let's say five or 10 years ago, websites exist existed as sort of like a library saying like, this is what we're all about. It's got our mission, our vision, our values. It's got, got our history and our accolades and it's got press and it's got a blog and it's got all of this stuff. And that stuff might be important and there might be uh, room for that on the website there, that might serve a purpose. But the only reason to have that stuff on that website is if it's helping to drive a specific action, right? If it's if it's meant to help convince someone to do what you really want them to do, but it really begins by you first understanding, what am I trying to do on this website? If you're a fast casual or quick service, you are trying to get online orders, right? That's what your website, uh, that's why your website exists. People come to your website, they should want to place an order and that should be very, very easy. If you're a full service restaurant, fine dining restaurant, right? If you take reservations, then usually that's the action you're looking to do. Now you can have a secondary action. You say primary action is to get people to make reservations. Secondary action is to shop from our online store or to place an online order, totally fine. Or it can be uh, place an online order as the first action. The secondary action that we hope to get is to sign up for our email list. That's fine, but you have to be very clear and it should be obvious if I go to navigate to your site. If you say, hey, come check out my website. Uh, what do you think? I should be able, the first thing I'm gonna tell you is this is what I think you want people to do. And you or my client or whatever would say, uh, actually, that's not necessarily what we want people to do. Or, well, I never thought about what we want people to do. But for me, it's very clear or not clear what you want someone to do. And what I'm asking you to do when you start building a website, when you look at your website, when you run a website audit and you say, hey, is this working? First thing you got to figure out is what do I want people to do when they visit? 
And am I making that as obvious and easy as possible? Now, to that end, the next bit of advice that I almost always give my clients, and I'll pass along to all of you listeners, is that you should probably be simplifying your website. Again, like I said a minute ago, there used to be a time maybe 10 years ago where we had everything in the kitchen sink on our on our uh, website. No more. The very best websites out there uh, make it very clear to take the action that, that they want you to take. Uh, the best examples I give are like uh, the Chipotle website uh, or Mighty Quinn's Barbecue. Google them. Go look at their website. I use that with my clients all the time. It's very easy to see. They either want you to place an order, find a location so you can place an order, uh, order catering, or now they franchise so they want you to become a, a franchisee. In all of those instances, they are collecting revenue. There's really nowhere they're taking people where they can't collect revenue. It's super, super important. So when you build your website, I would say simplify as much as possible, right? What action do you want them to take? Is it very easy for them to do that? And if they need additional information to be convinced then we add that to the website, but we also make it right, uh, make it easy for them to take the action you want them to take on that page. Perfect example. We're gonna put all our accolades, our press and, and our, our, our reviews and all of that. You should put a button somewhere on that page for them to make a reservation so they don't have to navigate away. Now that you've read all the accolades, all the testimonials, you've read the reviews, doesn't this make you want to book a reservation? Once you've seen the pictures of our food, don't you wanna place an order now? So if you need an additional site, again, because you think your user, the, the potential customer, needs more convincing, then that's fine. But be really judicious with the kind of, uh, with the number and type of other pages that exist beyond the ones that can collect revenue, beyond the actionable, actionable pages or buttons. Again, it all comes down to that CTA, a call to action. What action do you want people to take? What else do they need to know in order to take that action? Anything else shouldn't be on there. Famously, I've said this on past episodes. I say this with my clients, sort of with a with a wink and a smile, but I hate about pages and, and about us page, right? Here's the history of the restaurant. Here's some bios of the chef and the owner and the general manager and all that. It's all lovely. And these people work very hard and I love being able to, uh, to put them on uh, up on a pedestal and, and celebrate them. But if that's not helping us sell the restaurant, if it's not helping us make the user or help the user take the action we want them to take, it doesn't need to be there. I would much rather all the, the history be sort of woven throughout the other parts of the website. I'd rather it exist on a blog and more in, uh, more about that in just a minute. There are other places, there are other ways to get that information across besides putting a dedicated page that's just stuff to read. Same thing with like a gallery, right? There's no reason to have a gallery page or photos page. There's no reason to take someone to a, a page just so they can look at photos. Your website should be photo heavy, or, or I should say content heavy, because photos and videos should be a key part of it. They should get a sense just from navigating around to the menu page and the, and the hours and location, all of that. They should get a sense of what your uh, restaurant is all about on the homepage, certainly. They should get all of that information. They shouldn't have to navigate to a gallery page. It's not like you've got it. It's not, it's not 1998. We don't have to put all of our media on a separate page. It can be all throughout the, uh, the website, and really it should be. All right? To that end, let's talk about high-quality content. I'm really sorry. If you're going to spend uh, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars on the restaurant of your dreams, please, for the love of God, spend $1,000 or $2,000 to get really great room shots, to get really great photos of your food, to get really great videos of your food. It doesn't have to be that much, but a little bit goes a long way, and high-quality stuff is now what our customers are coming to expect. So don't scrimp out on crappy photos or stock photos. Use real photos and spend the money to get great content made. Guess what? We all have iPhones now, and with good lighting, even an iPhone can take a pretty fantastic picture, right? Next thing I'll say is about uh, keeping it constantly up to date, right? So there's this thing, and we're going to talk about this, especially when we start talking about SEO, right? That that Google, that that the search engines like when a site is quote unquote alive, right? When 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 it's living and breathing, and that there's things being updated and changed, right? Because it makes it feel like oh something's happening here. So there are ways to do that, right? Changing out your menu works. 
right? Uh, having a blog, right? So something you're constantly updating, adding to, that's a way of doing it. Constantly trading out sort of the testimonials and the reviews that you use. Um, all of that is really great. Even if you just do this uh, once a month or even once a quarter, um, just a little bit of uh, freshening up of the site um, is worthwhile. And again, we're gonna talk about a blog in just a few minutes. It's still one of my favorite uh, things to do uh, for, a, for a website for a bunch of reasons. Uh, but make sure that it's up to date that it's living, that it's breathing, that it's um, that it continues to evolve with you. That can mean changing the copy, changing out photos, videos, updating the menu, adding to the blog, all of that. Really, really important. All right. When we're also talking about website, it's a, it's a it's a really great place, uh, and it can be a really great tool for capturing email addresses. And this really comes down to lead generation. I talk about this a lot when I talk about my triangle principle, right? The triangle, uh, the triangle principle of marketing, which says that there are three sides to triangle, three sides to marketing our businesses, attraction, retention, and evangelism. Attraction just has to do with customer acquisition. You have to be acquiring new customers on a consistent basis. Uh, having an email capture on your contact page, on your hours and, and location page, in the footer, and then probably even a, like a pop-up. All of those are great ideas. And even if you just put it there, you'll see, you'll gain about five or 10 email addresses every single week without even having to try for it. That's one of the reasons, um, one of the things that you wanna be able to use. Finally, the last thing, and this is part of lead generation. Um, if you are running any sort of social media ads, and we're gonna talk about this in a bit, you should have a pixel, right? So a Facebook pixel installed on your website. If you're running Google ads, you should have a Google pixel installed on your website. And this is just cookies, right? This is so you can track people who have visited your website. Because what you wanna be able to do is uh, create retargeting ads. And you can tell people, you can tell Facebook, show this ad to anybody who's been to my website in the last 90 days. If they've been to your website, they heard about you, they read about you, they went to learn more about you. So they're already sort of warmed up. So what better audience to try to target with our advertising because they already know who you are. They already probably like you, like you enough, certainly enough to go to go navigate there and explore your website. So adding a pixel to the website so that you can retarget them uh, later is really, really important. It has a lot to do with, again, how we dial in our digital presence. So that's the first section I wanna cover, uh, your website. It's really, really important. It's your mothership. It's the uh, it's the stand-in for your restaurant. Uh, it's your restaurant on the internet, and it's gotta, it's gotta be great. It really does. Next, uh, the next big area I want to cover is SEO, search engine optimization. This is a very technical uh, part of the internet, a very technical part of, of what we call digital presence. I'm going to share with you the top 10 uh, things that affect or influence uh, your search rankings, right? And they're very, a lot of these are super technical, and I'll sort of break them down as we go in. I'm not going to go into too much uh, in too much depth, if you want to read more, you just Google, how do I optimize optimize my website for SEO purposes? Uh, there's tons of great content out there in the internet. I'm simply trying to raise uh, raise awareness of, of the issue. So again, the top 10 things that affect or influence uh, your ranking uh, when it comes to SEO. Number one, real info. I always talk about NAP. Uh, and I always talk about you know NAP, and I add an H there as well. NAPH, name, address, phone number, and hours. The H stands for hours, right? They call them NAP credentials. Name, address, phone number, and hours. Make sure those are very obvious on your website. Make sure they're up to date. That's really important. You also wanna make sure that they match across the entire internet. So if your hours are listed on Facebook and Google and TripAdvisor, that they're the same as what's listed on your website. If there's incongruity there, uh, Google's gonna, gonna rank you lower because they're gonna say, oh, this isn't being minded, it's not a very conscientious business owner, whether they're right or wrong, that's all the, uh, the internet can surmise by this mismatching information. So your NAP credentials or your NAP H credentials, make sure they're up to date on your website and really across all of the internet, anywhere you're listed, it needs to be it needs to be current. Number two, it needs to be a secure and accessible website. Uh, these days, accessibility for um, uh, for uh, for blind. Uh, uh, blind users, that's really important, right? Making sure that uh, that there are labels on the pictures. Again, it's a very technical thing, but making sure it's secure, that goes without saying, so that it's a secure website, and then also that it's an accessible website. You can Google that, there's a lot more being written about that, but just know that that's something that you've gotta do. Number three, page speed. You really can't affect this too much, uh, but the page should load quickly uh, for all users who uh, who use it. 
Number four, mobile friendliness. They say this, right? You got to think mobile first. Uh, more people will search the internet on their phones than they will at a desktop or a laptop. That's just uh, that's just real data, right? So if 60 or 70% of the users will visit your website via mobile, it stands to reason that you got to make sure that it looks great. That's why they say mobile first. A lot of designers these days will design the mobile site first, right? Really think about the user experience on that mobile site and then uh, and then build out the, the desktop site after that. Totally possible to do. You're gonna talk to your web designer, your web developer, or if you're building yourself, you're doing it on a site like Squarespace or Wix, uh, I would just click the little button that lets you view, um, that lets you view the mobile uh, version and build your site that way and then sort of uh, optimize it for the desktop afterwards. That's what we mean by uh, mobile first. Number five, again, this is a very technical part of this, uh, but it's domain age. So your domain is your website, right? So uh, restaurantxyz.com, that's your domain, uh, your URL and the authority that you have within the world. So this is just age. Legacy has a lot to do with SEO, right? It says, uh, there's a lot of experts who say it takes a long time to change your SEO score, right? It takes three months to ruin it, but a year to get it back. Um, and and for, for whatever reason, it just takes time. So the longer you're around, the longer you can build authority in the space, the more trustworthy you become when it comes to something as very technical as search engine optimization, which just means how you rank in uh, Google searches or Bing searches, right? Number six is optimized content. This has to do with keywords, right? That making sure the words that are key to your business um, are, are very obvious all over your page. So if you're a farm fresh, farm to table, local, whatever buzzwords you wanna use, right? If you do smash burgers, make sure it's very obvious there um, what, what you're known for. If you're known for burgers and shakes, make sure to talk all about your shakes, your milkshakes, your, you know, your, your hand spun, whatever it is. Whatever words are key need to be there and obvious. So when we talk about optimized content, that's what we're talking about. What keywords do you wanna rank for? Somebody who's looking for a burger place doesn't know that you have a burger place unless it's all over your website, right? And and so and so that then that they know that, that Google will know that you've got a burger place. Here's a really important piece to this. This has to do with your menu. If you are still uploading JPEGs or PDF menus on your website, you have to stop now. This is something that's really happened just in the last four or five years. You have to have real text on your website. So it needs to be a really clean interface. I get that. I know why people upload their menus because you like the way your menu looks and you wanna be able to present it to the diner the way that uh, it looks. And I'm telling you, you're hurting more than you're helping. The real text has to be uh, has to be uh, typed in and, and on the website page. Because when Google comes over, when the Google crawlers or the spiders as some people call them, when they crawl over the website, they see menu page and all they see is picture. They can't read the pixels. They can't read the text. What they read is a character that's on a website. So if it's, uh, so if it's not in text, if it's only a PDF or a JPEG, meaning an image file, it doesn't know anything that's on there. So if you're a burger place and you got 12 different kinds of burgers, they don't know that because they just see pixels and they just see picture. So do yourself a favor and embed that on there. This has a lot to do with what we talk about when we talk about optimizing your content. Seven, technical SEO. This has a lot to do with the headings, the subheadings, the uh, metadata on the back and the URL slugs, meaning if this is your menu page, make sure it's restaurantxyz.com slash menu. Make sure it says menu in a headline at the top of the page and make sure the metadata on the backside, and that's a very technical thing. You can talk to your web developer about that or Squarespace makes it very easy to do that, but make sure you put in menu. So people know what this is. And so Google knows or Bing knows what is on that page. This is the menu page. That's the slug. The URL slug is the restaurantxyz.com slash menu slash menu is what we call a slug. This is the very technical part of SEO. You gotta think about the user experience. This goes hand in hand with what we just talked about with the website, right? That's very easy to navigate, that it's frictionless, that it's fun. Um, things like, uh, like like time on page or bounce rate. Bounce rate is some when someone um, visits a website and then immediately clicks back. So imagine somebody's reading a review of a, uh, of a restaurant, they click the link and they go check out the restaurant website. They don't like what they're looking at and they just click the back button. That's a bounce, that's bounce. 
where they go to the page and they immediately bounce away from that. What you want is that somebody comes to the page and then goes somewhere else within the site. It's one of the reasons why experts recommend that you don't do a one page website, right? So one page where you just keep scrolling down, down, down into infinity. A lot of experts think that's not great. It's better that it, you have people navigate away to the menu, navigate away to the special events page or whatever it is. Even though you're trying to make it easier for, for the user to navigate, it's actually better for, again, a very technical part of SEO that they go to different pages. Now, I don't want you to have a million pages, but having three or four pages is totally fine. Like an hours and location page, a menu page, a private events page, and maybe a reservations page or a contact page, right? Just do a couple where they can navigate and it's gonna make all the difference. Uh, number nine, again, a very technical piece of this, which is links, which is going to feed into the next thing we're going to talk about, which is press. But having backlinks, so having links on your website that link out to other reputable uh, places, so to partners, to other reviews, things like that. But then likewise, a backlink. So you want a directory or you want to be listed on a top 10 list on Eater. You want to be on the infatuation. You want to get reviewed by a big magazine because they're going to include what's called back backlinks. So their list of review and at the bottom, it has the information about the restaurant and a link to go check out the restaurant's website. That helps you. The more of those you can build, the more places you can be listed so that traffic is coming from a multitude of places to one uh, mothership, right? That's why I call the, the website your mothership. That ends up helping you quite a bit when it comes to SEO. Finally, the last piece of this, the 10th aspect of SEO is reputation. This has to do with reviews. Everywhere you were re reviewed on the internet, so Google, Yelp, TripAdvisor, Facebook, Foursquare, anywhere else where you can think of, all of those are being factored in now more and more to how a restaurant ranks. So your uh, your rating actually matters uh, matters quite a bit. So when we talk about website and SEO, they are related. They are they're somewhat separate but related. And it, uh, SEO is a very technical uh, field, and you, we can certainly go a lot deeper. Um, we've gone about as deep as I wish to go here, but the bottom line is it's got to be easy to navigate. It's got to be clear uh, what you want people to do. It has to be optimized, right? The content has to be optimized and it has to be alive. This is what I wanted to say about blogs, right? And this is the perfect opportunity to do it. A blog offers you an opportunity once a week or once every other week to talk about yourself, right? To talk about the food you serve, the people in your restaurant, the, the, uh, the farmers you partner with, whatever else it is. It gives you an excuse to, uh, to write about yourself. It, it offers you a, a place to house a lot of content on your website. And then it also offers you an excuse to reach out to people via email. So if you send an email to 5,000 people and you say, introducing our new spring menu, click here to see everything the chef's got cooking up, and they click there and they go to your website, for the, very, for the sheer very technical aspect of, of links, what you're doing is you're getting a bunch of traffic to go to your website. Every time you send an email and uh, and it drives traffic to your website, you are helping yourself be found by other people that you may not even know yet. It is a very technical thing, but it helps. And then again, just an excuse to talk about yourself and the things you're doing to celebrate what you're doing. I think all of that is a really, really good thing. So keeping the website updated and alive, right? We talked about that a few minutes ago. That's important. Uh, using it as an opportunity to, to uh, put keywords in there, not stuffing every little keyword in there, but the five or six or eight words that you think are really important to your business, the blog offers you an opportunity to do it. And then it also offers you an opportunity uh, to put it on social media, to put it on LinkedIn, to, to email it to your list. And so people will link Click the link and come to your website, come to that blog article, which is housed on your website. All of that is really, really gonna help you. So those are the first two areas we wanna cover, websites and SEO. And that sort of, again, we're talking about links, that takes us right into the third area, which is press, right? So I live in New York City, I've worked, uh, spent the last 20 years working here in New York City. Press is a big part of what we do here, right? There's some big, big PR agencies that try to get attention for their clients. And you don't even need that. You really, really don't. Um, while it would be nice to have, and they can certainly help you um, get further along than you could do it on your own. I wanna say here, you can absolutely do it on your own. 
when you're talking about press, really what we're talking about is relationships. And you should make an effort to build relationships with local writers, with local publications, whether that's websites or magazines or newspapers or whatever, so that you get written about, right? Anytime you have a new spring menu, anytime you're opening, you're launching a new this, a new that, you've got a new chef, you've got something to talk about, you should be putting out a press release or reaching out to people to say, hey, there's a story here. And that's one thing I really want to say here. This is something that I want to talk about. For me, press really comes down to relationships and your pitch, your story. What's the angle? Basically, what you have to answer is what's going on and would anyone care? Or what's going on here and why would people care? If you can frame that, right, either you reach out to uh, to writers, food writers, bloggers, editors, and say, here's the story, right? Here's the scoop. This is going on and this is why it's important, right? We have a new chef and this new chef is important for this town or this neighborhood or this restaurant for the following reasons, meaning people are gonna care about it for the following reasons. Really what I'm asking you to come up with here is your elevator pitch, right? Your elevator pitch of, of, of what you're all about, why this matters, why you're doing what you're doing, why anybody should care. That's the key to press. And I talk about this a bunch, but it's really never been easier for you to make uh, connections, for you to build relationships with press. Now, I'm not saying to be their best friend or to annoy them, but it's very easy to reach out and say, hey, I'd love to pitch you a story. What's the best way to do that? Hey, we've got, a, we're launching, uh, you know, for the first time in our history, we're, we're launching brunch, or we're now starting to do brunch on Fridays, or we just launched a late night menu. Tell them that you're doing it and tell them what it is and why it's important. And say, hey, what's the best way to do this? What's you know, what's the best way to uh, to make a story out of this? The other thing that I will say is that the more you can find trends, um, this is what all the best publicists I know do. They say, hey, here's a new Greek restaurant, and Greek I think is really popping up. There are four new Greek restaurants that have opened up in Manhattan in the last uh, three months. So you reach out to uh, to an editor, you reach out to a writer that you may know or that you've seen. You say, hey, I really love your uh, your writing. We're new to the neighborhood. We're a, we're a Greek blump blump. What, what's your angle? And I think there's a real movement here. There are actually two or three other Greek restaurants. And you know, we're one of four that have opened just in the last three or four months. I think there's a story here. We'd love for you to do a story on Greek food and specifically on us. Now you're now you're pitching them a story that has a little bit to do with you, but it's also bigger than you, which also you know sort of broadens the appeal uh, for the writer and for the publication, and yes, even for the audience, the audience that you're ultimately looking to reach. So even though it may not necessarily be a story all about you and how great you are and why people should care about you, it will be a little bit about you. So by pitching somebody else, uh, you actually end up helping yourself. Yes, you help others, but you help yourself as well, and that's one of the key points to press. So you see now how it's all sort of related because the more press you get, the more backlinks you're going to get. And backlinks help you with your ranking. They help uh, tell Google uh, that people love it. There's a lot of traffic going to your website. So again, your website, your SEO, and your press. Those are the first three of the six areas I want to cover. We're going to cover the other three in just a minute after a word from another one of our sponsors. Running a restaurant is already a tough job. You're busy keeping customers fed and employees paid while working with, yes, we know it, razor thin profit margins. The last thing you should be worried about then is if you're doing sales tax right. That's why you should consider automating sales tax for your restaurant point of sale system. Collecting and filing sales tax on your own can be stressful and it can be time consuming. It can leave your business vulnerable to accidentally missing tax payments or not having enough money in the bank to cover your tax obligations. Davo by Avalara simplifies sales tax for your restaurant and brings peace of mind through automation to help you pay the full amount you owe on time. Just integrate the Davo app with your existing POS like Clover or Toast uh, or Square or Spot On and set up your business and banking information. Davo will take sales data from your POS system and determine how much sales tax you collected each day. Then it sends a request to your bank to have your sales tax put into a secure holding account. This keeps your sales tax separate from your revenue and helps reduce potential confusion about available funds. You'll get a daily email from Davo letting you know exactly how much sales tax was transferred. And when your sales tax is due, Davo automatically remits your sales tax to the appropriate authority on your behalf in full and on time. Is your restaurant in a state that does on-time filing discounts? If it is, then Davo will automatically send this refund back to your bank. 
Don't let sales tax spoil your business. Stay on top of sales tax with automation from Davo by Avalara so you can spend less time in the back office and more time in the front of house. Learn more at davosalestax.com slash restaurant strategy. Again, davo, D-A-V-O, salestax.com slash restaurant strategy and try Davo free for the first month. As always, you'll find that link in the show notes. Now, we've covered the first three areas of, uh, of really how we dial in our digital presence. Now we're gonna cover the last three and I'm telling you, you're gonna, you're gonna thank me for it. This is a very technical area. This is something we really never talked about even five years ago and it's becoming a, a, much, bigger, um, a much bigger part of, uh, of what's required to maintaining a good digital presence, especially in the restaurant industry. That is citations, reputation management, and finally, we're gonna round up talking about social media. So let's dive into citations. What the hell do we mean when we talk about citations? Citations are simply your information, that your information matches across the internet. Remember, we talked about this a few minutes ago when I talked about the NAP H credentials, right? So NAP, name, address, phone number, I add the H for hours because it's that important. Making sure your name, address, phone number, and hours are the same across the entire internet is really, really crucial. And when you start thinking about it, when you look at all the places you could be listed, a lot of them you know about, but I'm telling you, even more, you've never even heard of. So you gotta make sure they match. Number one, you wanna make sure that the readers of those publications, somebody who's on a directory, somebody who's reading a review or whatever, um, when they click that link, it actually goes to your website. When they're trying to book a reservation because the hours are listed as one thing, that it matches what your hours actually are. So it becomes really, really important. Citations is a very technical part of maintaining your digital presence, but it's also a really crucial part. And again, this wasn't on our radar five or 10 years ago, and it's become a really big deal now, making sure that everything matches across the internet. I've talked about this company before, I'll mention it again, Marquee, M-A-R-Q-I-I. -I. They're a company that do this. Basically, you'd update it into the system, and then that goes and populates everything. So Yelp, and TripAdvisor, and Foursquare, and the infatuation, and, and Eater, and wherever else you are, across the internet. And there are sometimes hundreds of different areas where your business would be located. But Marquee is a tool that would do all of that for you. You don't need to use a tool like that, but, that, but you then need a plan or a system for making sure you can do it yourself. So understanding citations, again, really technical part of the, uh, of the digital presence, uh, but no less important than anything else we're talking about over the course of this. The next thing I wanna cover is reputation management. Reputation management simply means your reviews, your online reviews. And I know I did an episode way, way back in the beginning of this. Uh, it was called Yelp is a four letter word, right? Yelp is a word that all restaurant owners hate because it's where people go to bitch about their experience. Except that's not exactly true, right? People go to Yelp, right? Famously, they're either five star reviews or one star review. Somebody goes there to rave about the experience because they just need to tell somebody, tell a lot of people about it, or they had such a horrible experience, so they just have to tell somebody about it or a lot of people about it. So famously, we sort of don't get like the mediocre, the four star reviews of like, yeah, it was really solid, it was great, right? It wasn't earth shattering, but it was really good. We don't get a lot of that. We get a lot of fives and ones. Understanding right, that, that people are, are leaving their feedback about you, it, it's so important to understand. Reputation management is a really big part of SEO and it's a really big part of your digital presence. And again, we've been talking about very uh, technical aspects of digital presence. This is a very, uh, very obvious one, right? If somebody is debating going to your restaurant or debating between you and one or two other places, they're gonna go do research and they're gonna make a decision. So what sort of information are they gonna gather in order to make that decision? One of the things they're gonna do is they're gonna look up your reviews and say, well, what do other people think? Do other people like it? Is it popular? Does it have a lot of reviews? Does it have a lot of good reviews? What do the bad reviews say, all right? So all of that becomes really important. You have to understand that that does influence how the public perceives you, right? Let's not pretend that Yelp doesn't matter. Yelp does matter. Let's not pretend that people aren't looking at the reviews on Google because we know they do. Um, even if they're not reading every single review, they're looking at the, the quick snapshot saying, okay, 4.4, that's pretty good. 4.8, wow, that place must be great. They're seeing the, the, the quantity and the quality, right? How many reviews? 
and how many stars. And I gotta say, even in my own behavior, right? So we just moved out from New York City. So I spent 20 years living in New York City. We just moved out to the New Jersey suburbs. We're in a new area. I don't know anything around here. So when we go get pizza or sushi or Chinese or whatever, uh, whether we're gonna go order online, whether we're gonna go find a new restaurant to go to, I look it up and I say, I, I don't know anything about this. Is it good? Do people like it? So yeah, I look at the website. Yeah, I look at the pictures, but sometimes I do go look at Google and I say, what's their, what's their rating? Do they have you know 4,000 reviews and it's a 4.5? That's pretty good. Or do they have 13 and they're a 4.5? Or do they have six and they're a two star? All of that factors in. So again, there's a very technical piece of, repu- of, uh, of digital presence and reputation factors into that. But then there's also just a very obvious case to be made for making sure that you get good reviews. So here's the question. What do we do to respond to those reviews? You should, if you haven't already, claim your Google My Business page. You should claim your Yelp page. If you can, claim your Foursquare and your TripAdvisor page, and you should be responding to each and every review. You don't have to do it in real time, but I would say once a week, put this into your tasks or or delegate this to somebody so that once a week they go check out the pages and respond to every single review. Here is my recommendation to all the good reviews. Say, thanks so much for the kind words, thrilled you uh, th- thrilled you enjoyed it so much, we look forward to taking care of uh, you next time. If you can pull out something specific that they mentioned in there, do that. Make sure they're different. Don't just copy and paste your responses, right? It'll, it'll look tired, people will see the same response over and over, and don't just do what I'm telling you to do. Find something that's authentic and natural to your voice, uh, to you the owner, to, to you the, the brand but you should be responding to each and every one and get specific. Say, I'm so glad you enjoyed the chicken. It's been our signature since we opened. Or, you know, yeah, I'm so glad you were able to have our chocolate cake. That's actually a recipe that was blah, 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 blah. Find some way to connect. Again, we talk a lot about social media and we're not social enough on social media. So find a way to engage with people. If somebody went out of their way to leave you a review, especially a good review, thank them for it and make them feel seen, right? That's a really important thing we don't say enough of. Make them feel seen. And now we gotta talk about the bad reviews because there will be bad reviews. The most important thing here is, is to remember, you are not trying to defend your actions. You're not trying to argue about what happened. Accept it, acknowledge it, accept it, and move on. All you're trying to do is apologize and show that you're a conscientious, engaged operator. Thanks so much for taking the time to leave the review. I'm so sorry to hear uh, that you had this experience. I'd love to ask you a few more questions about your experience. If you've got the time and you wanna reach out to me, here's my email, or here's my phone number. Uh, I, I'd, love to, I'd love to find a little bit, uh, learn a little bit more about this experience so we can fix it for the future, right? Don't offer them a free drink or a free dessert if they come in to turn it around, uh-uh. Just be a conscientious, engaged operator and say, I'm so sorry to hear that you had a a, a bad experience. Uh, I'd love to fix this for you and I'd love to make sure we fix this for the next time. Um, If you don't mind, just reaching out to me and uh, giving me some more feedback. I've got a few more specific questions for you. So that you're showing publicly that you're engaged, but you're not engaging with them. You're not trying to sling mud over the course of that. You're resolving it privately. You're showing that you're engaged publicly, but you are resolving it privately. This is super, super important. And again, respond to each and every uh, bad review, just like you're responding to each and every good review. And, and just and think of it in this term, you're not doing it to try to win that guest back. What you're doing is you're writing it for all the other people who don't know you yet, who are coming to the Yelp page to learn more about you or reading the reviews, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And even if they read a bad review, they're seeing you step in and say, and take ownership of it and apologizing for it and trying to set it right. That will go further than you can imagine um, as you uh, as you, as you you try to manage your online reputation, all right? The next thing I will say uh, about this is that you should have a system for trying to collect reviews. Now, I'm not trying, not saying you should buy reviews, right? There are a lot of people that say, hey, I'll give you 10% off your check if you leave us a five-star rating and review. That's not what I'm saying. Hey, leave us a review and we'll give you, uh, you know, $5 off your next visit. I am not saying that. That is bribery. That is paying for reviews. Absolutely not. But what I think you should do is look for the people that are having a great time in your dining room. You know, your managers are walking around table touching anyway. So why don't you have a more meaningful uh, interaction with them? 
hey guys, I just want to make sure you're enjoying everything. It looks like you're, you're having a great time. Of course, they're going to say, oh my God, we're having the best time. They say, I'm thrilled to hear that. What did you have? What did you like? You're going to engage with them in all the ways you're hopefully already doing. All you're doing is at the end say, Chris, listen, I'm so thrilled to hear you're enjoying it. It looks like you're having a blast. If you wouldn't mind doing me a favor and just telling, you know, telling everything you just told me, just go write that on Yelp. It looks like you're having a five-star experience. Go leave us a five-star review and just tell people everything you just told me. You are not asking for something that they're not already feeling. You're just saying, can you do that publicly? It would, it would make a big difference. If you did that once a night or, or a couple of times a week, you would start racking up a ton of five-star rave reviews on Yelp and Google, and it would make a really big difference on the technical side of, of digital presence and just on the sheer optics of it, right? If people see that people are having a good time, they're going to say, I want to go there because it looks like people have a good time. So do that. When it comes to reputation management, that is a key way for you to management. So now the last area we're getting to, it's social media. I always leave social media for last because I really believe all this other stuff will actually have a bigger influence on your bottom line than social media will. And I know that sounds crazy because social media is huge. It's such a big part of our life, but it's big because it's new. There's something still novel about social media, but we have to understand that reach is decreasing, Right? At least organic reach is decreasing. Impressions are decreasing. Right, If you've got you know, 5,000 followers, they say only 2 to 3% of your followers will see your content, which means nobody that's not your follower is seeing it. Right, That nobody beyond is seeing it. So you have to be really clear about what our expectations are for social media. I'll say this. Again, when we're talking about digital presence, how you exist on the internet, social media is important, but I always like to treat it as a lookbook. Think of your Instagram page, your TikTok, your, your Facebook, whatever it is you're using. Think of it like a lookbook. It is part of a prospective diner's research, right? Where do they, they don't discover you necessarily on Instagram, but they go to do research about you on Instagram. So they hear about you from a friend, they go to your website, they look at your menu, and then they click to their Instagram. Or they hear about you from a friend, they go to your, check out your Instagram, they look at the pictures, they get a sense of what you're all about, and then they click through to go to your website and check out your menu and your prices and see if maybe they wanna make a reservation. That is the path. One of those two ways are typically how people will land on your social media pages. So what I want from you is simply to acknowledge that. Organic social media, now, and we're gonna separate it, right? Social media really is in two different arenas. There's organic, and there's paid. Organic exists, in my opinion, to keep your pages alive uh, and, and to act as a lookbook so that when somebody's trying to learn more about you, get a better sense of what it's like within your four walls so that they can determine whether that's the right place for them, that they can then go do more research. But an organic strategy is no longer enough. 10 years ago, it was, it was plenty. You didn't have to do any more, right? But now it is such that all these websites, all these platforms, I'll say, have a real estate problem. I said this before. There's only so much content they can fit in a timeline. They can fit on a feed. There's only so much content that, that Facebook can show me the consumer. So they have to make decisions. They make decisions by targeting, by, by algorithmic choices to say, um, I'm gonna show this person the following content because they're most apt to like this content. Remember, remember, Facebook wants to show you stuff that's most apt to keep you on Facebook. That, that's just in their best interest. So you need an organic strategy. And again, I would think of that in terms of like a lookbook. Not a lot of people are gonna see that content. There's very few people who are gonna see that content, say, oh my God, that's a juicy burger. Let's go out for burgers tonight. It just doesn't happen that way. So understand how organic social media is typically used uh, by the average user. And then let's build a really great paid strategy. I've done episodes on this in the past. I can certainly talk to you more about this. There's a lot written about it. You can Google it. You can get in touch with me, chip at chipclose.com. That's C-H-I-P-K-L-O-S-E.com. We can talk about a strategy. It's a lot of what we do in my coaching programs. I work with my clients to help them do this. We can talk about that. We don't have the time to get into that. All I'm simply saying at this point is that you should have an organic and a paid strategy, right? 
So social media aren't social platforms. Yes, they are on the surface. But really, what was created, right, what Mark Zuckerberg created was the most sophisticated targeting platform, the most sophisticated advertising platform ever created. It is so sophisticated because of how it targets, the specificity that we can get. We can say, show me, we know who loves our restaurant. And I can tell Facebook, show me other people like that. Like we know that our key uh, target audience, our, our, our key customer uh, fits the following uh, criteria. So show me people like this or show my content to those people. And so we have to use that in a very specific targeted way. When we do social media, make sure again, just like we're doing with our website, there's, there are specific calls to action, especially with the paid, right? It's not just a blanket advertisement unless that's, uh, or, or just a, you know, just a, a general brand uh, awareness ad, right? Unless what you're trying to do is just get in front of as many people as possible. For the most part, I'm gonna recommend that there's a specific thing, a specific action you're trying to get people to do. Sign up for our list, book a reservation, buy a ticket, buy a hat, merchandise, whatever it is, right? So understand that with social media, there should be an organic strategy and a paid strategy. Finally then, I will say that one of the questions I ask is that are you using the platforms the right way? One of the things you can do to use them the right way is to, again, uh, develop two different strategies here, right? Two totally different ways of using the platforms. But then when you're building out your organic content, make sure you're using pillars. So I talk about content pillars a lot. That every piece of content should number one, fit into one of these buckets. We call them pillars, right? So for a restaurant, it might be food, beverage, the space, people, and your neighborhood, right? Everything you put out is gonna fall into one of those buckets. It's gonna be celebrating or promoting your food or your beverage or your people or your neighborhood or your space. That's my guess is gonna be for most restaurants. Maybe yours are different, that's fine. Maybe you wanna talk about your partners, the, the farmers that you partner with, or maybe you wanna talk about, I don't know. You understand, there should be pillars. Every piece of content should fit into one of those things. Nothing outside that you have to know what it's trying to do, what it's trying to promote. The other thing is I always talk about the ED model. E-D, E-D-I-E, I didn't make this up, this has been around on the internet for about 15 years. Every piece of content should do one of these things, should either educate, demonstrate, inspire, or entertain. So E-D is an acronym, right? E-D-I-E, -E. educate, demonstrate, inspire, or entertain. Everything you do should do at least one of those. If it does at least one of those, it will succeed. It can do more than one at a time, but it's gotta do at least one. So when we talk about whether you're using uh, the, the social media platforms in the right way, those are two key things. Is there intentionality with what you're posting and how you're posting and why you're posting? And then are, do you have an organic and a paid strategy? Finally, the last thing I will say, and we talk about it a lot, and I know it's hard to do because it's time consuming, therefore probably expensive, but you have to take time to engage on the social platforms. That means respond to comments, reach out into people's DMs, uh, you know, promote, ask for feedback, things like that. You've got to go into other people's pages and be, be a sort of a, 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 an active member of the community, right? And think of, your internet world, your Instagram world is your community and you've gotta be an active participant there, right? Just like the PTA at your kid's school, right? You've gotta be an active participant. It's really, really important to do this. So that's it. Those are the six areas. When we talk about dialing in digital presence, websites, SEO, press, citations, reputation management, and finally, social media. I hope all of that was helpful. Before I uh, say goodbye, before I sign off, I just wanna remind you one more time that I host uh, the P3 Mastermind, right? This is a, a group coaching program that I run. Uh, we've got dozens and dozens of different owners and operators in those. We've got two different groups because we filled up one, so we launched another one, uh, and we have room. We are always adding more. If we ever fill them up, I will simply add a third group. If you are struggling with profitability, I can show you a way to generate generate consistent, predictable 20% profits every single month. If you don't believe me, then just sign up for a call and let me explain, uh, let me explain how it works. And let me learn more about you and your restaurant so that I can, uh, I can understand the uh, specific and unique challenges you're dealing with. Again, the best way to do that, sign up for a free call with me. It's a 30 minute coaching call uh, where we'll talk about the program for sure, but really we'll try to drill down and understand where you're at and I'll give you some actionable tips. Even if you decide not to move forward with the program, you get like a free 30 minute coaching call. So again, visit restaurantstrategypodcast.com slash schedule. Again, that link is in the show notes. Appreciate you guys being here and I will see you next time.